Okay, so uh, for the last few weeks, we have been, uh, we've been keeping our messages very, I guess what you call conceptual. We've been keeping it very big picture. Uh, recently, we sent out to the community uh, some mailers with a question, uh, are you living the life that you were made to live? Which is a very, very conceptual question, really. Most religions, most philosophies are aimed towards figuring out the answer to that question or figuring out if it's a question that needs to be answered at all. So for the last few weeks, we've been, uh, we've been looking at the answer to that question in, in a lot of different ways. Again, just keeping it very conceptual, looking at things like, why did Jesus Christ come to earth? And what does God want with us? And why does God do what he does? And what's Christianity all about? And that kind of thing. So this morning, we're going to do, uh, we're going to do that one more time. We're going to do it at a very different, uh, from a different perspective, different angle than uh, where we've been coming from. So let's uh, start off with a question here. I want us to think this morning about why we're here. Not here uh, as in existing, not why do we exist. Here we go, you are not my mother-in-law. But that's okay, because it's still water. Uh, ask the question, why are we here? And again, not why do we exist, but why, why are we sitting in this building? Why are you sitting in this building? I mean, because of church, obviously, but, but why, why do you come to church? I guess you could say, oh, well, because of Christianity. I come to church because of Christianity. But, but why does Christianity matter? I mean, think of it this way. In our, in our modern world, we have something of a, uh, of a marketplace, a competitive marketplace for ideas and philosophies and worldviews. And really, like whether it's social media or whether it's books or whatever it is, constantly we have all these different ideas and perspectives vying for our attention, trying to say, no, this is this is the right truth about life. No, this is how to live your life or whatever else. So in this, uh, in this modern world full of many, many different ideas and many different religions and worldviews, why, why Christianity? Why does Christianity matter? I mean, if you think about it, the stuff that we teach, the stuff that we believe, the stuff that we base our lifestyles around, these are words recorded thousands of years ago. Stuff that some guy taught 2,000 years ago. Why does it continue to matter? Why does, why does Christianity matter? In other words, what is, what is Christianity all about? I've, uh, that's one of my favorite questions to ask churchgoers. Because I think uh, the way people answer it really, um, it really shows where your focus is at. Depending on how you answer what the point of Christianity is, it's really going to show where your focus is at as a Christian as a churchgoer, while you're doing what you're doing, while you're in this building. And uh, usually when I ask people that question, I get uh, two basic answers for the most part. And they're, bo they're both really focused on the, uh, the work of Christ. And so I'm quickly going to go over both these two common answers I get, because it's in looking at these two answers that I think we're going to get a fuller perspective of what Christianity is all about, why it matters. And that's a crucial question for us to uh, understand and keep in front of us. So the first thing that I, uh, I come in contact with a lot, the first answer I hear to this question is focused on heaven. Why does Christianity matter? Well, it's, it's our way into heaven. It's our way into life everlasting, into a place that's better than this after we die. And this is why Jesus came, to get us into that place. And so whether it's by an explicit statement or whether it's by people living their lives saying, well, heaven is the focus of Christianity, this is something I hear, I hear a lot. I mean, I, I, think, I think we'd all agree that heaven is a big part of Christianity, right? And heaven is, heaven is a really good thing. It's, a, it's a encouraging to me. When you read about heaven in the, uh, the New Testament, it's always talked about as your hope, your hope for the future. Because even if things are hard right now, even if things are going to be difficult, when it's all said and done, you're going to go experience eternal relationship with God. It's a great hope, and it's core to Christianity, but is it okay to make Christianity all about heaven? In other words, heaven is the end all. Everything else is peripheral. Heaven is the end we're trying to meet. And again, I think, it's like if you word it like this, you take the gospel. Gospel means good news. Is the good news that Jesus Christ enables us to make the cut make the cut whenever we die. In other words, is the good news that we've, we've got our ticket. I've got a ticket to ride to the other side, right? Is that the good news? Is that the fullness of the gospel? Does it end there? 
See, from my perspective, when I read the words of Jesus Christ, and when I read the words of guys like Peter and Paul, who interpreted a lot of the words of Jesus Christ, I actually can't find much of a focus on heaven. I, if it's there, I'd love for someone to point it out to me. But at most, it's mentioned here or there. Paul mentioned it in like, encouraging people who are going through hard times. But in terms of a focus, especially with Jesus Christ, it didn't seem like it was his primary concern. He seemed to focus on a lot of other stuff. And really, I, I don't think that heaven was Jesus' primary concern at all. In fact, uh, there's a, a statement made in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, kind of a mission statement for why Jesus came. We talked about this briefly last week, but I'll just read it again. This, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. In other words, this is what he's going to try to do. This is what he's aiming to accomplish. He's going to save his people from their sin, from the actions that we do that mess with our lives and mess with those around us and mess with God. He's going to try to save us from those actions. And I think it would have been really, really easy, like extremely easy, for it to be written here, you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from hell. And that's what he's trying to do. Or he will save his people into heaven. That would have been, this would have been the right place to say that. But instead, the, the, uh, the focus is on sin, which is interesting. There was a very uh, wise man named Dallas Willard, and he was commenting on the, uh, the emphasis a lot of modern Christianity places on heaven as the end all. And uh, he makes this analogy. He says, if I had to choose, I would rather have a car that runs than insurance on one that doesn't. Make sense? And he says, and why can't I have both? Why can't I have a car that runs and insurance on a car that runs? In other words, what you see a lot of the time, or most of the, all the time, really, with Jesus Christ is an emphasis on life now and life working and functioning now as opposed to simply insurance on a dysfunctional life. So that's the first thing I come in contact with a lot. Heaven as the end all of Christianity as opposed to the hope we have for the future. The second thing is this. I come in contact with a huge amount of emphasis on forgiveness as the end all in Christianity. In other words, it's all about getting us forgiveness for what we've done, and therefore it buys our ticket into heaven. That's the second thing that we have on the slide up here. Jesus came to secure our forgiveness, and therefore we can get into heaven. It's similar to the first one, but there's a different focus. There's a different thing placed with, uh, within premacy there. Which, I mean, okay, forgiveness is core to Christianity as well. I don't think anybody here would disagree with that. It's a huge part of the message of, that Christ brings. Okay, there's forgiveness available. There's reconciliation available for you and God. Even though you've messed up in the past, God can forgive you and accept you back into relationship. That is really, really good news, right? So forgiveness is core. But the problem here comes when you make forgiveness the end, just like making heaven the end, as opposed to a means to a greater end. When forgiveness is the end that you're trying to reach, well, really, uh, <laughs> I, I saw it best put on a bumper sticker a way back. It said, I'm a Christian, not perfect, just forgiven. Which again, okay, I don't know any perfect Christians. I don't know any, you know, people who, who are quite perfect. And I do know a lot of forgiven Christians, so I, I get that, not perfect, just forgiven. My problem with that comes whenever you say just forgiven. Because you're erasing everything else, you're saying, wait, 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 hold on, hold on. Just because I'm a Christian doesn't mean I'm any different from everybody else. I'm just forgiven for all the stuff I do. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. My life is just as dysfunctional and messed up as everyone else's, but I have the stamp of forgiveness on my messed up life. And that's the message that we bring to humanity. Yes, your life is messed up, and it'll continue to be messed up forever. But at least you can have the stamp of forgiveness on it. And again, I've got to ask myself, is that the message of Jesus Christ? Is that the gospel? Does it end with forgiveness? I don't think anybody would debate that forgiveness is core to the whole thing. But is that the end? Was his message, hey, look, look, sin is still going to be your master, guys. Sorry. Your life is going to be a constant struggle with doing the stuff you don't want to do. Full of sin. Your relationships are going to be dysfunctional. Your marriage is going to be a mess. You're always going to hate your job. You'll be miserable forever. You're never going to find peace or joy 
or fulfillment here on earth, but at least you'll be forgiven for all the stuff you do. Was that the message of Christ? Because once again, I, I, I read the words of Christ and the words of Paul and Peter, and I can't find where it ends with just forgiveness. It seems to me that forgiveness is a starting point to something much, much bigger. In fact, in, uh, in the letter, uh, Paul's letter to Titus, in chapter 2, Paul says this. He says, Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. And once again, it would have been really easy for Paul to say, Jesus gave himself for us in order to secure our forgiveness, period. Sentence done. But he doesn't. He says he gave himself for us to redeem us, to pull us out of lawlessness, which is a synonym for sin, by the way, and to purify for himself a people of his own possession who are zealous for good works. You see how the giving himself for our forgiveness is a means to a greater end? It doesn't end there. And so again, I don't think we can say Christianity is all about heaven or Christianity is all about forgiveness. Those things are core. Those things are wonderful, extremely important parts of Christianity, but it doesn't end there. So again, I think, I think it's in looking, looking at the words of Christ that we find our answer for why Christianity matters. It's in looking at the, the words and the witness of the New Testament that we find what really is uh, at the heart of Christianity itself. And there's a verse where Jesus makes a very, uh, a very profound statement in John chapter 10. And this is a verse that you'll hear us repeat a lot around here because I, I believe that it is one of the most beautiful verses in the Bible. It's certainly one of my favorites. And I think it's a concept that we need, uh, the church as a whole needs to grab hold of this concept before it can be, uh, begin to live out the life that God designed us to live. But Jesus said this, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I came for this purpose. My mission is focused on this, that they may have life and have it abundantly, that I may have life, that you may have life, and have that life abundantly. And that's a really, really important statement right there. When the man himself gives us the here's why, we better pay attention. And rather than, having a, rather than simply preaching the promise of a far-off heaven alone, or rather than sim simply preaching forgiveness as an end in and of itself, it seems to me that what Jesus Christ taught, what Jesus Christ proclaimed on earth, was an offer of hope and redemption for our actual lives, for, for life, our lives, the lives that you and I are living today and tomorrow and the next day. Those lives... Jesus offers hope and redemption for those. He proclaimed real life change. Actual, uh, he, he proclaimed a life and an entrance into a life that is entirely different and entirely deeper and better than the life that we're used to living. He offers us a place in the kind of life that we were made to live. And there's that question, are you living the life you were made to live? Because that's what Jesus Christ cried out to humanity on earth. Are you living this kind of life? Because you were made to live this kind of life. If you're not, would you like to? Of course you would, because it's so much better. And this was the, the message of Jesus Christ. It's, it's better life. All, everything you read in his teaching, you gotta wonder why Jesus Christ was so focused on teaching people how to do things right. Hey, hey, you should do this instead of this. Hey, don't do this, do this. Build your, hand, build your house upon a solid rock instead of sand, all this stuff. It's focused on how we're actually living, focused on how we make our choices and decisions. Because his teaching was again focused on bringing us in to life and life abundantly. That's what his mission was. And even when you look at the life of Christ himself, when you look at how he lived it, what you see displayed is a life that was good, a fulfilled life, a meaningful life, abundant life, not just getting through not just, oh, I'm, uh, Lord help me, I'll make it until I get to heaven. But a life that is as it was made to be. I can't think of any other way to describe it. Life as God designed it. That's what Jesus Christ displayed in his life to us. And it's that abundant life and the offer of abundant life that is crazy, crazy good news 
not just for humanity as a whole in some abstract way, but for you and for me. The offer of this is, is such good news. That is such gospel right there. That is the gospel. It's an entrance into the kind of life that we were made to live. And you've got to think of it this way. You take a figure like Jesus Christ, who was a guy. Let's say, according to secular history, he was just a guy who walked the earth 2,000 years ago. I guess we're not quite there. Almost 2,000 years ago. We're in the middle of his lifespan here. Why is a guy like him still a dominant figure in pretty much every society in the world 2,000 years later? Why is he still uh, relevant? Again, you're looking at teachings that are like cultures have been changed over, over and over and over again. We're in a, we're in a completely different era, com- different language, different society. Everything is totally different. Why are his words still so relevant? Even the non-Christian, even, uh, even philosophers still debate his words and whether this is right or wrong. We're supposed to be morally superior now. We've advanced. Why are his teachings still so incredibly relevant? And I think the answer, I think the answer to Jesus' enduring relevance is his historically proven ability to speak to, to empower, and to heal the ordinary human condition if you follow my meaning. In other words, what Jesus offered was 100% aimed at just us. Nobody special, nobody whatever. He's talking to those ordinary people living ordinary lives like us. And he brings a message and a hope of, of redemption to something better and deeper. Life as it was made to be. His moral teachings are still as every, every bit as relevant today as they were 2,000 years ago. The same reasons that people had for dropping their lives and following him, hearing what he offered and saying, I I want that. Those same reasons still apply today because he brought the words of truth and he came that we may have this life and have it abundantly. There's another statement made in John chapter 1 that I feel like it's a beautiful statement of what Jesus really had to offer for us. And it says, in him was life. And that life was the light of the world. Isn't that beautiful? In Jesus Christ was life. What he offered was real life. And that life was the light of the world. That light, that life made sense of human existence. How much better is it to be in a well-lit room than a pitch black room? If you're walking through a beautiful garden and it's pitch black, how much do you appreciate of that beautiful garden? When it's lit up, suddenly you can see the beauty. Suddenly you've made sense of the garden itself, right? And in him was light, life, and that life was the light of the world. That's an awesome statement. So very briefly, let's look at three reasons why, why this abundant life that Christ offers is very, very good news for us. Why it is, uh, it is incredible absolutely superior to any other life choice that we could make to follow him and his teachings. Three reasons. Here's reason number one. Reason number one, the abundant life is available to us now. It's available to us. See, what's cool about this whole thing is that we don't have to wait until heaven to start experiencing abundant or functional life. What's cool about this is that we haven't uh, missed our chance, as it were. We haven't messed our lives up so badly with our own choices that we've missed our window. That's what's so great about the message of Christianity, the message that Christ brings. He says, hey, look, it doesn't matter what you've done or where you've been. What I'm offering is redemption for that life that you've messed up. There's no point that we're beyond saving. And that's really one of the most profound aspects of the way that Christ came to earth and the life that he lived. For the most part, he lived a regular human life. You ever ever notice that? Has that ever struck you? He lived as a guy. He, (laughs) it's like, okay, you're going to send the Son of God to earth to proclaim truth to humanity. You're thinking like a guru, right? And he's like meditating and floating around, whispering the secrets of the universe to people, right? Instead, Jesus is born as a baby with parents, You know, Jesus had four brothers and at least two sisters. Isn't that weird? Like, he grew up with them. And they're not all like, 
praising him from an early age. When he announced that he was, you know, hey, by the way, I'm the son of God, everyone they're like, oh, sh- <laughs> whatever, Jesus, come on, man. Can you imagine growing up with Jesus as your sibling? It's probably really irritating. Like, quit turning my water into wine, Jesus. Quit it. The sibling fights had to be really prime. I wish I could have been there. It's weird to think about Jesus living an ordinary human life, but that's exactly how he lived. It's exactly the way he came. He worked as a carpenter. That's not a super glamorous job. If you're a carpenter, I have a lot of respect for you. But he was just, like, it's like a job, like any other. And what's so important about this whole thing for us to understand is this. If Jesus were to come today, as he did back then, he could be, he could work in any occupation you can imagine. And none of it, none of it would be the least bit hindrance to him living out the abundant life that he proclaimed. In other words, he could be a clerk or an accountant or a banker or a doctor or a farmer or a, a mechanic or a school teacher or anything that you do or that I do, he could do. He would work in this job. He'd, he could have your life. He could have, live in your apartment or your house. He could have your car and your car payment, your measly salary. He could have your family, your friends, your skills, your talents. He could be in your situation and he could live the life that he was designed to live, if that makes sense. He could live out the abundant life that he proclaimed, the abundant life that was his and that can be ours through him. Isn't that a cool thing? And that's a very, that's very planned. It's very planned that we can relate with him at that level. In Hebrews, it talks about Christ being not, not some high priest that we can't relate with, but it says he was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. And we say, oh, well, he was, he was God. We can't relate with him, and yet he calls us to. He calls us, you are to be holy as God is holy. So either he's crazy, or he's cruel in calling us to do what we can't do, or he's actually saying, hey, just, just do the stuff I'm asking you to do. In the Great Commission, he says, go and make disciples of all nations and teach them how to do what I taught you how to do. Teach them to do the things that I said to do. That was his concern. Not just with getting us into heaven or just getting us forgiveness. He was concerned with how we live our lives. He says, teach them how to do this stuff. I taught you to do this stuff because it's important stuff. And what's so cool with this whole thing it's one of the most beautiful and profound aspects of Christianity and the Christian message is the fact that every single one of us, no matter what we've done or where we've been or where we're at, the abundant life is available to us wherever we're at. It's a door that we can step through and continue to walk through. It's just a matter of making the decision. And that's awesome. So that's number one. It's available to us. Number two, and we'll look at this very quickly because we talked about it a lot last week. Number two, the abundant life is functional. It generally just works better. And last week we, were, we spent a lot of time talking about God's motives and giving us the directions that he gives us. Why does God tell us to do what he said to do? If you missed the message last week, I'd encourage you to go uh, online on uh, YouTube. In the next few days, we'll have it up on our YouTube channel. But why does God tell us to do what he tells us to do? And the answer we found is uh, Deuteronomy 6, verse 24. Moses says, The Lord commanded us to do these things for our good always. When he tells us what to do, it's because he wants what's best for us. And God himself said in Deuteronomy chapter 5, he said, if you would just do the things that I'm calling you to do, everything would go well for you and for your descendants forever. Why? Because God knows how we should live and how we should function. And he's just telling us how to do it right. Again, we don't want to spend a lot of time on this. We talked about it a lot last week. But very simply, the abundant life, the life that Christ proclaimed, just works better. It functions better in reality because it is a description of how we were designed to live. It's a description of how to live the life that we were made to live. And that's really cool. That's number two. It is functional. Number one, it is available. Number two, it is functional. And lastly, number three, the abundant life is fulfilling. 
it's fulfilling. Um, how many of you have heard the U2 song? Uh, it says, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. And I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Right? It's, you know, it's, it's a nice song. But really, that is, a, uh, that, is a <coughs> that is a cry that is at the heart of not just this generation, but I think it's, a, it's been at the cry of every generation that has ever existed on this earth. I, I, have, I have not found what I'm looking for. I mean, how many of you know that people are looking for something to fulfill them? That people are looking for something to make them happy? I want, to, I want to get my happiness. They're looking for something to bring them peace. Something, they're looking for something to bring meaning and purpose to their lives. That's the cry of this generation. I haven't found what I'm looking for. It's got to be out there. It's got to be out there somewhere. And Jesus makes a very intentional statement in John chapter 6. He says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And he's not talking about literal hunger or literal thirst here. He's talking about how many of you know what it feels like to be hungry and to not have food? How many of you know what it feels like to be thirsty and to not have water? It's digging at your very being, right? I've got to get food. I've got to get water. Jesus is saying here, hey, you know what? doesn't matter what else you try to fulfill yourself with, it's not going to work. Because what I'm offering you is the truth about life. What I'm offering you is life as it was made to be. And if you come to me and you follow my teaching, you're never going to hunger like that again. You're never going to thirst like that again. And that's cool. You know, I, I, what, what's so, it's so cool, I, I think, about the gospel and the, the message of the heart of Christianity itself. It's not something that we have to try to twist to make look attractive to humanity. In terms of like proclaiming it to the world, it's not something that we have to butter up because it's beautiful. It's the best thing you could possibly be told. Hey, do you want something that will make your life work better? <laughs> that will bring you fulfillment? All those things that you're looking to find, do you want the answer to all of it? Because that's what it is. It's just the giant, the answer. Here it is. There's a reason it's called the gospel. There's a reason it's called the good news. Because it's actually really, really good news. And there's really, the, there's nothing else that can truly fulfill us. It doesn't matter what else we try to cram into the whole of our soul. Nothing else is going gonna, is gonna to fit. Only the abundant life, only in living out our lives as they were meant to be led, walking hand in hand with relationship with our creator. Can we experience the kind of joy and peace and fulfillment and meaning and purpose we were designed to walk in? And I've seen, over and over again, I've seen Christian families go through terrible, terrible things. Things that the world would say, well, that's it. You have no reason to live anymore. And yet they emerge to the other side stronger somehow, still walking with a hope in their creator God, still walking with a confidence in their Lord. And that's something the world looks at and goes, ah, you guys are crazy. When they're not crazy, <laughs> they just have a deeper fulfillment, a deeper meaning, a deeper purpose to their life, a peace and a joy that is unshakable by anything the world can throw at you. That's the kind of stuff that Christ offers. You know, in, in planning out this message, uh, we, every Tuesday we meet together and we, uh, we try to plan out the message and discuss it together. And Canaan, my brother, our worship leader, yeah, we were talking about this idea of the abundant life. And he goes, you know, um, the best times in my life have been those times where I've actually followed the directions that God gave us. The best times in my life have been those times where I've actually tried to do the things Christ called us to do. My life just seems to work better. I seem to be more fulfilled, more at peace. And that's not a coincidence. It's by design. It's by design that that is the case. He said, the best times in my marriage, the best times in my friendships, the best times working whatever job I'm working have been those times where I'm living under the umbrella of the abundant life that Christ calls us to live, even in the midst of suffering. 
And our human life, this life that we call our human life, it's not something that is destroyed when we give it over to God. It's something that is fulfilled and fulfilled only when we give it over to God. And again, that's just, I, I repeat this a lot, but that is such good news. It's crazy good news. So for those of you who have heard this and say, hey, I want that, I would encourage you to grab hold of the words and the teachings of Christ and refuse to let yourself set them aside or refuse to let yourself put them uh, in any other place aside from top priority in your life because there's nothing more worthwhile to be put in that place of top priority. Uh, for those of you who want a starting point, for those of you who are looking at your lives right now and going, well, I, I, I'm not experiencing the peace, I'm not experiencing the joy, the fulfillment that Christ said that we'd experience. My marriage is not functional. My friendships are not functional. I, I need that kind of function. Come talk to somebody who is further down the path of the abundant life than you are because uh, I know that anybody in this room would love to help anybody who wants help. So Father, thank you so much that the life you designed for us is so worth living and so fulfilling and so so peaceful and joyful and it's so wonderful. God, I pray for those of us who are looking at this thing and who want it. Who this morning are looking at our lives and say, I, I want, I, I need to be there. Father, I pray you'd help us. You never said that it would be an easy thing, but you did say you'd be with us, Lord. That you'd help us. And I pray that you would help us. We love you, Father. Amen.